Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion today. I will start by sharing a land acknowledgement. So as we embark on today's journey of learning and reflection, it's important that we recognize the systemic manner in which some communities on the land we call Canada have been impacted by eating disorders. First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples often had their traditional methods of procuring food and their relationship with the land forcefully altered through the processes of settler colonization. The residential school system aimed to sever these connections among children with exploitative processes and treaties that weren't upheld, creating legacies that still impact the well being of people to this day. In Canada, dietitians participated in experiments on Indigenous children at residential schools without their or their family's knowledge or consent. Social workers have removed Indigenous children from their families and cultural knowledges. Therapists, psychologists, and psychiatrists often work within the confines of treatment modalities or assessment protocols that have primarily been researched among white folks. Reconciling these truths and committing to change involves understanding how we can build a society where we can embrace conversations about identities, social conditions, and health, and how these things intersect. As we talk about pathways to working in the eating disorders field this evening, we believe it's important to recognize how complex histories of whiteness and colonization present barriers for people who are Indigenous, as well as for people who are Black and those with other intersecting identities that experience marginalization in our field. As a non-Indigenous settler myself, I see acknowledging these truths and actively working towards reconciliation as critical. If you're curious about learning more ways that you can take action, um, Ari is going to share some links in the chat. A couple that I will specifically point out. Um, one is Medic's recent initiative, which is the creation of guides to eating disorders in Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities for uh, by and for community members and carers. And so there is or there will be an Indigenous community members resource. It's currently in the works, um, but the link is in the chat. So please do check that out when it becomes available. Another post by an Instagram account called Nutrition Diversified, what does reconciliation look like in dietetics, which relates directly to some of the themes that I have mentioned. Okay, and if anyone else has, if any attendees have other relevant resources, please share these in the chat as well. We have the chat open for today and we plan to, to keep it open. So again, thank you everyone for being here. My name is Caitlin, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the manager of community outreach and education at Sheena's Place. I will be your moderator this evening and your co-host along with Ari from Netic. And so I'll tell you a little bit about Sheena's Place and then I'll pass it over to Ari. So for those who are not familiar, Sheena's Place is a community mental health charity and we provide group-based support to people affected by eating disorders and disordered eating. We offer a wide range of groups and workshops to anyone ages 17 and older in Ontario. Uh, most of our groups are virtual, um, but some are in person in Toronto as well. Um, all of our groups are free of charge and an eating disorder diagnosis is not required to attend. Um, and so if you are looking for more information about accessing groups at Sheena's Place, you can send an email to info at sheenasplace.org um, or reply to the um, email that you got with the Zoom link in it. Um, and I'll pass it over to Ari to share a little bit about Netic. Hi, everyone. My name is Ari. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator at the National Eating Disorder Information Center. We're a registered Canadian charity that have been helping people affected by eating disorders since 1985, and we operate a nationwide toll-free telephone helpline, as well as an online live chat program that provides support, information, and referrals to people who are affected and those who care for them. You don't need a diagnosis to contact our service. It's an anonymous and confidential service, and anybody can reach out. Around 30%-ish of those reaching out are people who are trying to support someone else. If it's a concern for you, it's a concern for us. Um, like Sheena's Place, we also deliver prevention-focused workshops to youth and facilitate professional development in person in the greater Toronto area and online across the country through our outreach and education program. And if you have questions, you're free to send a private message to me in chat. You'll see chat and tech support next to my name, 
or email netic at uhn.ca. And I will toss this back to Caitlin. Thanks, Ari. Um, so you'll notice again that the chat is open to everyone. Um, if you have a tech question, like Ari said, please send him a message uh, privately. But if you have a question or a comment in general for the panelists, you can send that to everyone. Um, if the chat does become too distracting, we might pause and turn it off for a bit, but I don't anticipate that will happen. Um, I will just remind everyone to stay on mute um, while we're here, unless you are asking a question during our Q&A. Um, another couple of things to mention, um, live captioning has been enabled. So if you would like to read captions um, to help um, with accessibility, you can click on show caption on the bottom bar on Zoom. Um, and you can hide it as well if, if you're finding that distracting. Um, as mentioned, this panel discussion is being recorded and it will be posted on both Sheena's Place and Netic's YouTube channel within the coming weeks. Um, we will not be recording um, the breakout room portion of today, um, only the, the part where we're all together in this one room. So we'll start um, by introducing our panelists. We'll ask them a few of our preset questions um, and then we'll open it up for attendees to ask um, questions to our panelists. Um, then, as I mentioned, we will have an opportunity to move into breakout rooms. So one panelist per breakout room where you can ask them um, more targeted questions and have a chance to connect with them in a slightly smaller, uh, more intimate space. Um, and then we'll return to the big group for a final wrap up and reflection. Um, before we get started, just a reminder to everyone to please do what you need to do to take care of yourself during this event. Um, you might find that surprising or difficult emotions come up. And if so, Ari will be available to provide support via chat um, if needed. We also do have a few language guidelines for our panel this evening. Um, so the panelists and myself um, have been asked to speak from the I perspective and to not make assumptions about other people's experiences. Panelists only represent their own perspectives, and we acknowledge that there are many perspectives that we don't have with us um, this evening. We're also asking panelists to avoid going into detail um, about traumatic experiences or eating disorder details. Um, so not naming any specific numbers or details about eating disorder symptoms. And so we ask that you as attendees keep these language guidelines in mind as well while asking questions and engaging in discussion, um, both in the main room and in the breakout rooms. So with all that said, um, we will now bring our panelists into spotlight mode so you can see them. Amazing. Okay, hello, hello. Welcome to you all. Um, we're going to start with a really um, well, sort of basic, but also could be a big question, which is um, to share, to just introduce yourself and to share what your current position um, and work is and how you first got involved in the eating disorders field. Um, so whoever would like to start, go for it. And then maybe I'll, I'll uh, go in a circle from there based on my screen. Anyone? Amanda, you're at the top, <laughs> if you do want to go first. Sure, I can do that. Um, awesome. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Rafool, and I'm a Canadian Institutes of Health Research uh, fellow working actually in Boston, Massachusetts, in the U.S. right now. I work with a group called STRIPED, which is the Strategic Training Initiative for the Prevention of Eating Disorders. And I am primarily a scientist with STRIPED that has a lot of focus on trying to translate research into policy action and advocacy. I came to the space of eating disorders when I was in my late teens doing my undergraduate degree at the University of Windsor in Windsor, Ontario. I kind of, I always say I slipped into eating disorders as a happy accident, <laughs> but I was uh, going through my own struggles with disordered eating and happened upon a volunteer opportunity at the local outpatient eating disorder treatment center in Windsor called BANA or a regional one, I guess. Um, and I started volunteering with the organization, doing some really basic data entry type of work and then was recruited into their health promotion team. So I didn't go into research first. I was doing uh, information booths at malls and <laughs> doing school uh, presentations about body image and nutrition. 
And as I spent more time in that space, um, got, you know, a little bit more familiar with my own body and relationship with it and got embedded in community, it inspired me to do uh, graduate degrees in public health so I could work on preventing eating disorders through broader systems and policies. So I'm excited to talk with folks about that today. Amazing. Thanks so much, Amanda. John, do you want to go next? Sure. Thank you, Caitlin. Hello, everybody. I'm John Choi. I'm the executive director at Sheena's Place. Um, so the organization Caitlin spoke about uh, to, in some detail earlier, um, so I won't go any further into that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a real privilege for me to, to serve in this role in this organization. I had spent, um, I guess, close to going on 30 years uh, in the mental health field uh, at this point, um, starting in frontline roles, um, learning a lot about assessment and treatment of uh, a wide range of um, mental health disorders, um, and spent a good amount of time working in community settings uh, supporting young people and their families. Um, and then I guess the last couple of stops prior to Sheena's Place, there was a real emphasis on um, ensuring that, that folks who were using the services, um, part of their experience was that they were seen and that they were heard and that they were deriving benefits from a feeling of connection and belonging. And the community was a, was a strong focus of the, of the spaces that uh, I was working in. And um, then the Sheena's Place opportunity sort of presented itself. And I hadn't had significant experience working in eating disorders. In fact, I'd spent a lot of time supporting clinicians uh, in situations where if an eating disorder was identified, uh, we would engage in some external supports uh, that were specialized in eating, eating disorders. Um, so it was always a, a topic that was one step removed from the, the supports that I was involved in delivering. Um, but as I learned more and more about the challenges that individuals with eating disorders faced, I, I became more and more curious and intrigued by just how complex the, uh, the situations were and, um, you know, the extent uh, of the, the needs often that we're presenting uh, for folks um, in, in those situations. And with the alignment of um, those experiences in working in community-based settings, uh, with the philosophies of, of peer support and, and community and connection. When the Sheena's Place opportunity presented itself, um, I was strongly drawn to the organization, uh, very strongly interested in learning more about eating disorders. Um, and um, the, through, I guess, some good fortune, um, secured this role and uh, spent uh, a good amount of the early uh, period of my, my stay at Sheena's Place learning about eating disorders. And I continue uh, to learn um, almost on a, a daily or at the very least a weekly basis uh, from colleagues and from participants in our space uh, about eating disorders and sort of still feeling a little bit on the, the steep um, sort of portion of that learning curve, um, but uh, feeling privileged to, to provide some support and assistance for the team uh, at Sheena's Place and, and for our participants. Thanks so much, John. Nolan, you're next on my screen. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Nolan Blodgett. Um, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist or social worker by training. I currently work in full-time in my own private practice, uh, providing psychotherapy, uh, as well as consulting and other, um, uh, other work as well. Um, so I kind of got started in eating disorders when I got a volunteer opportunity at Netic, uh, which Ari described earlier, um, while I was in grad school, uh, and I was not planning to work in eating disorders. I had some lived experience of that myself, uh, and it wasn't something that I was necessarily um, set out to work in. And then I found working with the queer community, it's super prevalent, um, and it just repeatedly was coming up with clients. Uh, and so that's when I became more interested, uh, particularly because in the eating disorder field, there's been these stereotypes for so many decades that uh, of who's affected by eating disorders. And rarely were people like myself or my clients represented in that. And so I started to become more curious about that. Um, and so 
Uh, I started developing workshops on body image tailored to queer men in particular um, and offering that kind of thing. And they were so popular um, that I really started to see how much of a need was there. Uh, so now I do a lot of individual therapy around that. And uh, just this past year, I also taught a course, I developed and taught a course at Trent University um, called uh, Intro to Critical Fat Studies. And so we're focusing on sort of unpacking fat phobia uh, and sort of a lot of the roots really of eating disorders. And so I've I've really enjoyed kind of doing the clinical work and at the same time doing a little bit more of the education um, piece and sort of understanding what's happening um, at a larger level. So that's how I've landed here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Nolan. And I would love to take that course. <laughs> um, Jennifer, you're up. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here today. I'm coming to you from Vancouver, um, working on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. So that includes the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. And right now I wear three different hats in my work. So I'm a psychologist who provides clinical care. Right now I work in a pediatric eating disorders center where I might give family-based therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy for youth. Um, also working with families of youth with eating disorders. Um, I'm also a, a researcher. So collaborate on several national projects. About half of my time is spent doing um, doing research, looking at predictors of treatment outcomes yeah. and looking at how we can improve services for eating disorders. And then I have a hat as my uh, clinical faculty role at University of British Columbia, where I do um, uh, uh, some seminars and courses for primarily uh, psychology, pediatric and psychiatric residents who are training in mental health. And uh, I think similar to some of the panelists who are hearing about today, I slipped into the field by accident. So I was actually in my undergraduate time uh, working in a lab looking at animal sexual behavior, so the sexual behavior of rats and trying to find a directed studies project and, and looking at options. And there were, were no options at that time. But in that lab, there was a graduate student who was doing some work on models of uh, eating disorders. And they said, was that something you'd be interested in? OK, why not give it a try? And that started my pathway that has led me to be highly specialized and working only in clinical settings and research settings. For, um, for eating disorders. So I was fortunate to go on to graduate school in Toronto where I um, studied uh, more about uh, eating disorder symptoms, disordered eating, chronic dieting. And then in my postdocs, which I went on to Europe to do, started specializing more in eating disorders and then came back to Canada where I've had these mixed clinical research positions. And I look forward to chatting more about these pathways with everyone today. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's it's already so interesting to hear um, the, the similarities between people's paths, the sort of accidental or serendipitous entry into the field, while also um, acknowledging how different these paths are, whether it's through clinical work, research, education, community outreach. Um, so thank you all for, for getting us started with that. Um, the next question that I will ask is about challenges that you have faced while working in this field. Um, so if anyone would like to speak to challenges that they've faced and what has helped them overcome, or not overcome, but face um, those challenges. And I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you decide who, uh, who goes first this time. I can jump in first. I think when I was reflecting on this question, one of the, the first thing that comes to mind that I routinely speak about with my colleagues is the challenge of people being really worried about coming to work in this field. And so when we do um, some of those seminars or education sessions, for example, and we ask if there's any anybody who's planning to go on or do a rotation in our program or some eating disorder service, we often hear, no, that's, that's not something that we're interested in. And I think that comes a, a hand in hand with worries and stereotypes about the field that we're working hard to try to dispel. And, and what has been really great for me in, in my role as supporting some of the psychology residents who are 
coming to the service and telling me I've never worked in eating disorders before and I, I suppose I'll choose this as one of my rotations and then coming to the end and saying, you know what, I think I'm going to go on and apply for jobs in the field because what once people are in, I think it demystifies a little bit, understanding the skills that people bring in other areas also can apply to working in this kind of specialized setting. And I think the second part um, that I often hear from people who are new to the field is the strength of what it means to work together on a team. And that being something really magical that people don't always get in some of their other settings. So I think some of the challenges it really takes supporting people and encouraging them to, to give it a try. And then just like I fell in accidentally and stayed, I think people start to realize that some of the pre preconceptions that they might have held um, before coming to, to do research or do clinical work in this setting starts to shift and um, I see people become passionate about it. And my research coordinator was reflecting the other day that in her psychology background training, she said she had maybe two or three slides out of her entire background of education for her degree on eating disorders. So she came in really knowing nothing about it. The job opportunity came up with my team and she's saying now she wants to go on to grad school. And the big part was just not having the exposure and not, uh, not understanding what a career could look like or what different opportunities look like in this field. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, a lot of fear of the unknown. And I think there there is not a lot known about the field, like you're saying, in, in even in courses about mental health in school, people are not necessarily even learning about eating disorders. And so how would they even know uh, what to expect when working in the field or, or how to get there? Anyone else? I think from a like non-clinical public health perspective, uh, the challenges that I face are a lot different and it's more so convincing people within public health that eating disorders are a topic that they should care about. Um, and that's a harsh reality that I didn't think I would have to face when I first entered the field. And so I think uh, my experience as a public health researcher doing eating disorders work has always been trying to fit the topic of eating disorders into other spaces. So during my graduate studies, I did a lot of nutrition policy work and I would try and squeeze eating disorders into those spaces and topics and areas and often was met with a lot of the same resistance that Jennifer kind of touched on around people misunderstanding them or not seeing the need for um, eating disorders in public health policy and prevention. Um, I've done work in collaboration with folks that do weight related work in public health spaces and faced a lot of challenges and barriers in those uh, encounters. And even just trying to do general mental health, public health preventative work has been uh, difficult. So I think that um, trying to find a space for eating disorders in the public health field has been a challenge that I still struggle with to some extent, even though I think I'm getting a little bit more comfortable standing my ground in a lot of those uh, physical and virtual spaces. Um, but it, it is a bit different when it's not clinical and you're trying to talk to folks about something that they see as only clinical. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Amanda. Maybe just to, to piggyback on uh, what Amanda was, was sharing, that um, really trying to help people wrap their heads around the pervasiveness of the issue and the intensity and the, um, the prevalence. Um, it, 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 there's just so many misconceptions and misunderstandings surrounding eating disorders that we have to continue to to try to to bring people around to understanding, and I think that uh, sort of continues to be uh, persistent as a challenge uh, of, of working in this space. Um, we support a lot of folks at Sheena's Place who are navigating different types of um, options for for treatment or for getting help in, in different settings, and we repeatedly hear stories of uh, of the, the the barriers and the challenges they face. We continue to hear stories about. Um, mixed messages or conflicting messages that they are receiving from healthcare providers or other supports in their natural environment. Um, and even for me, just having conversations with my partner at home um, or, or other people in my, my network that um, have, um, have just, I guess, grown up and, and, and live with um, some ideas and, and beliefs that are um, more consistent with diet culture than 
um, a, a, a healthier approach to understanding, uh, approaching um, eating related issues without judgment. And yeah, it, 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 there's just challenges on so many different levels based on uh, people's understandings or, or lack of understanding of, of, uh, of the, the issues that we're trying to, to trying to address and support folks through. Thanks, John. Nolan, any challenges you'd like to speak to? Yeah, um, I think very, you know, similarly to what folks have shared, uh, my challenges have mainly surrounded working with uh, folks who are not really like seen as um, important in the eating disorder field. I, I don't know if that's the right language, but most of my folks that I work with are like often larger sized, um, for example, and often excluded from like medical programming uh, where there's like a BMI limit uh, to get treatment or things like that. Um, and there's a lot of misconceptions where often people are not being believed by their family doctors or um, other important people in their care networks that this is a problem uh, for them. And, and I think those misconceptions about what eating disorders look like in people who are larger, people who are queer uh, or trans, uh, it can be really tough to navigate, and particularly being in private practice, um, it's really isolating because I don't have access to an, a care team at all. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the folks I work with, their eating disorders are like relatively stable, and we're kind of working on getting more at like the root cause of it and, and that kind of thing. But sometimes folks get to a place where they really need medical intervention, and it's really hard as like a private practitioner in the community to help folks navigate that. And so it can be really intimidating. And sometimes those more serious or more like urgent cases feel scary for me because I'm like, I don't have a direct line of communication with a physician uh, or someone. And so there's can be like a lot of imposter syndrome, like, can I even do this work? Or should somebody, you know, more qualified do this? But then not a lot of people are doing it, especially with the the population I work with. So um, I think it's just a lot of coming up against feeling like I don't really know what I'm doing, but also nobody really knows because nobody is researching it in these specific communities a lot of the time. There's not a lot of resources specific uh, to these folks. So uh, I feel often like a little bit of a trailblazer without even necessarily wanting to be. <laughs> um, so that's been my main challenge. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing. I'm, I mean, I'm hearing like a lot of different challenges coming up. And I think in in everyone's answers, though, I'm also hearing like a lot of persistence and creativity in increasing understanding or, or, or finding solutions, um, patience as well, and compassion for oneself and for other people. Um, so thank you all for, for sharing about that. I'm wondering if we can flip um, flip it a little bit and and now speak about the rewards of working in this field like what do you find to be some of the more rewarding parts um and anyone can can get us started uh, maybe I'll, I'll i'll start uh, and i'll be i'll be brief but um uh i guess before i i speak specifically to to the rewards um Sort of acknowledging and, and uh, expressing empathy for for each of you uh, in, in in the struggles that you're facing and, and the the hard work you're doing. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that there is like a lot of good reasons for hope um, that that things do seem to be shifting um, and and it it's absolutely challenging and frustrating and and the, all the barriers we've we've talked about are are very very real. Um, but it is nice to see that. Governments are willing to direct more resources than they had historically been towards eating disorder um, supports, um, and um, there's a growing acknowledgement of the of the issue. Um, so, at the very least, there's some incremental change that seems to be happening. Um, that is some some reason for hope. And um, speaking for myself, in in terms of what's uh, been rewarding, absolutely consistent with my other experiences and working in other areas of mental health. Um, any opportunity to interact with with participants or service users and hearing um, some positives about their experience um, and, um, and and working with with members of, of my team, uh, both internally and in at Sheena's place, we are blessed to have a, a fairly sizable roster of, of uh, professionals who 
support the delivery of our, our programming. Um, th there is no shortage of uh, inspiring and happy stories that uh, I'm very privileged to, to get to hear. Um, and uh, those, uh, those sometimes uh, contained experiences, uh, you know, they seem to kind of string uh, together to, to absolutely sort of buoy the, the overall experience and, and, um, and make this job uh, very rewarding. Thanks, Ben. Maybe I can follow up with uh, John's reflections because I think that that hope and seeing some change in the field is really what's standing up for me in the last year where prior to this, I had many colleagues applying for research grants from large agencies like the Canadian Institutes for Health Research and not getting them. And now it seems like if, every time somebody's applying, I'm hearing good news about somebody in the field. and new guidelines coming out from um, Jennifer Couturier and her group at McMaster that then led to this development of a Canadian panel that could look at some virtual care and um, some of the work of other colleagues across Canada about developing, developing guidelines, developing new services. And I think it's an exciting time. And, um, and I think linked with that is the passion that many of my colleagues, both um, both from the clinical side as well as research side, have. And I had the fortune last week of having a large event here in British Columbia that some people joined from across Canada through the Eating Disorders Association of Canada. And hearing people's passion and ideas as, as we heard our, our keynote speaker and thinking about how can we look for some ways to change our system and and um, and people really wanting to continue improving things. And I think from my own clinical lens, that has been one of the things that has, has kept me in the field because we um, provide services. And I think particularly for me being based in a pediatric setting, seeing change and seeing kids get, get back to their life and getting those, those follow-up updates uh, that somebody's off at university or had a baby or uh, other exciting life updates that, um, that for families at the time that they're first coming to us in crisis just seem unfathomable of how to even survive the day, let alone get, get to these, these positive places. And I think that has been a, a really rewarding aspect that um, that has led me to also try to think more about how, how can we have more patient-oriented research within our own program and try to weave in more of the, the stories of people to guide some of, some of the directions of where we're going moving forward with our research. Yeah, I can piggyback off of that. Um... I, I would say that what's most rewarding for me, definitely, as both of you have just said, is the the hope. I think this field is like everyone I've met that works in it is so passionate and so excited about it. Um, there's so much room for creativity and innovation because uh, there's so much work to do. Um, and so the the every time I connect with somebody new in the field, I feel like more inspired. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I love doing the education side, whether that's in a university setting or more in community settings is every time I start to see people, you know, just to even take away a little bit about unpacking their own internalized ideas about diet culture and, and fat phobia, you know, it feels like making this larger impact. It's not just the people struggling with eating disorders, but also we're, you know, creating more of a social shift in understanding our relationship as humans to food and eating because it's so much bigger than an individual clinical problem. Um, and so I think coming together in like events like this and conferences and things like that are always what kind of keeps me going in this field because I feel, uh, yeah, excited about the opportunities that we have to build something really great. Um, and then obviously in the clinical work, seeing those long-term changes and seeing people actually be able to sort of come to a place where they feel like they're, you know, in recovery, whatever that means for them or, um, you know, be able to kind of enjoy their lives again or enjoy food. Uh, that's always a really beautiful thing to watch and to witness as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Nolan. Amanda? Yeah, I, I think everyone's touched on a lot of the really hopeful elements. And I think um, the progress, especially we've seen in the last two to three years and in, in the 
funneling of resources into eating disorders, into the expansion of clinical care. I, I want to acknowledge like, that comes on the back of, or the backs of people who've been doing this work for decades, who didn't really see much happening. And I think that, you know, there was this threshold that either happened uh, and was triggered because of the pandemic and the really unfortunate rise we saw in cases of eating disorders or concerns around disordered eating in the population, but also the fact that a lot of people have been doing this work for a while. And I think um, as a field, we're getting really creative about ways to um, move ourselves up the priority lists and political agendas. Um, and I can even say that like in the policy advocacy I do, um, I find it really rewarding when uh, not just that I do a research study and then it goes off into a journal, but when I can take that to a policymaker and say, this is why, for example, diet pills are harmful and we need to get them off the shelves, or this is why weight discrimination um, causes uh, a whole range of negative health issues and economic uh, costs to society as well. And so I think that the fact that we can, we now have this space where we've creatively adapted ways to get our, our work out there and to help populations is, is a really positive thing that's been a long time in the works. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, definitely a lot of common themes around hope and, and noticing things changing in recent years. Um, yeah, thank you all. I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, so for attendees, if you do have questions coming up, um, you can send them to Ari directly in the chat. If you want to send them anonymously, you can send them to everyone or you will have the chance to ask out loud. So as you're thinking, I'll ask this, this last question for now, which is, what could we as a community be doing more of in order to proactively encourage more people to work in this area? What supports do you think are needed? What could we be doing? Maybe I'll take it before I hand it over to the clinical folks or the primarily clinical folks. Um, I think from a public health and research advocacy perspective, we need money. Like I think that uh, Jennifer was talking about like grant funding for eating disorders was like basically impossible for many years. And then uh, now we have a little bit more progress, but for folks to go into the field, especially folks who come from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds, um, they need to have the resources to go into a space where we don't have, you know, industry funding the same way other health issues might, or we don't always have as much philanthropy money coming in. Um, and so I think that government resources will allow for more folks to enter the, the, the eating disorders field as researchers, but also as policy advocates, because it's really tough to be an advocate and I've had this conversation with so many people that work in clinical settings for eating disorders, especially, it's really tough to be an advocate when you have a, a wait list for folks that want to see you clinically, um, or if you yourself are struggling in your own ways. And so I think that having those resources will allow people to be a little bit more flexible with uh, prevention research, but also with some policy advocacy too. Absolutely. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah. And maybe I can draw on some of the experiences from um, a, a colleague from Australia who was at our um, event provincially last week, Dr. Tracy Wade, who uh, is in Adelaide, Australia, talking about the innovations in Australia and what helped them make some advances. And, and I think um, she was really highlighting the importance of having a unified voice of stakeholders that included uh, people with lived experience, people who are working in the field, policymakers, um, to come together to show the need for these services. And ultimately, they've been able to um, develop a national center for research and knowledge translation. They've been able to implement more publicly funded or subsidized services and streamline a certification process so that uh, consumers know that the who the people they're going to, whether they have appropriate credentials and specialization in eating disorders. And I think looking to, to some of our international colleagues and some of the work that, um, that has been done there can help us reflect on how, how can we make these innovations in, in service provision, service transformation, so that it, I think, becomes a more, um, a more visible place to work. And then from a more detail focus lens, 
that it's starting to set some of the expectations like in some services people if you don't choose to do a rotation in eating disorders, you have no exposure to clinical service in eating disorders. And yet I have many colleagues who are not specialists um, in eating disorders reaching out to me saying, gosh, I'm working with somebody in private practice and they're, they're really having a hard time and losing weight. And I think they may have an eating disorder and what should I do? And so kind of realizing how can we support people who aren't specialists in, in the area as well? to have enough, enough education support to help their confidence um, in, in being able to, to support in whatever their, their setting is as well. Um, yeah, I would say uh, echoing everything that's just been said, um, you know, I think what comes up for me is that uh, a lot of the time people don't recognize like how common disorder eating is. And, and it can't just be these like specialized treatment programs that can be so hard to access and have these long wait lists. We have to, you know, look at more broad kind of societal shifts that we can make. And so um, I think education is a huge one. Like I, I barely heard about edu uh, eating disorders in all of my uh, time in university. Uh, so most of my education or qualifications were things I sought out on my own, paid for on my own. Um, and so I think really exposing not just clinical students, but also like people in a range of different disciplines, because some folks come from all different backgrounds that end up in policy and research that could be relevant. Um, and then I think, you know, so often when I'm with clients one on one, I feel like, you know, we're just kind of putting a band-aid in a sense on the problem, like we need to do more. And so uh, what I do that makes me feel better at least is to really, whenever I can try to like educate everybody around me about diet culture, you know, I think on a daily basis, I probably hear somebody uh, make some kind of comment that relates to kind of perpetuates some harmful idea about food. And so just trying to like educate more broadly in our lives, the people around us, our colleagues, um, to like start like more of a social shift in how we think about it. Um, because uh, yeah, I think if it stays this very specialized field that only folks in it are looking at, um, we're not gonna see the change that we need to make. I would, um, sorry Caitlin, yeah. I would uh, definitely echo um, all of the, the, the comments and the sentiments that had been already shared. Um, I, I think it does really boil down to um, expanding our conversations and finding ways to include uh, the discussion of eating disorders in, in our, our discourse and, and our dialogue and each sort of each and every opportunity we have, um, just because the, the lack of awareness is, is so significant. I often wondered um, you know, when, when different types of clinicians or physicians decide on specialties, sort of what goes into that, uh, that, that thought process. But, um, just creating more opportunities uh, to the extent possible. And, and um, hopefully an event like this might help. Maybe there's one or two folks in the audience that uh, may be swayed in a different direction as a result. Um, but at Shina Space, we're also um, working on continuing to develop uh, more and more um, resources to provide education to folks to increase their awareness of what opportunities might exist or in what different ways uh, someone might come to work in the eating disorders field in, in, in a variety of uh, disciplines in the, in the way that Nolan mentioned that, uh, that it's not just a social worker that would be someone who worked with someone or just a physician who worked with someone that, that social workers and physicians are important, but so are psychotherapists and dietitians and um, you know, yoga instructors are just, there's just such a breadth of, of different folks. If they were trained in how to support folks with eating disorders better could make a positive impact um, in, in our space uh, on, a, on a broader level. Thanks, John. Thanks so much, everyone. And I think this actually leads very nicely into our first um, attendee question, which I'll read out loud, um, just word for word. Um, so this person says, my question is about how to work in this field if you don't have post-secondary education in psychology or sociology. It seems like all of the panelists are highly educated but are there positions for BIPOC who have lived experience with ED? It seems as though to get the qualifications to work in this field, I would have to endure working 
in very oppressive institutional spaces, i.e. universities, hospitals, healthcare settings, for me as a queer BIPOC, which would be expensive financially and also from a mental emotional health perspective. Any thoughts, any ideas for this person? And I imagine others who are thinking similar things. Maybe I can jump in again, drawing on um, our Australian colleagues and some of the, the models that they've been developing, they're sharing that there, there are programs where there were requirements of people with lived experience as mentors and really trying to build in the expertise of, of people with lived experience alongside um, health professionals in um, psychotherapy, psychologists, and, and other pathways, and uh, showing some good evidence about the, the power of connecting with people with lived experience and, and figuring out how does that fit within the system and um, also highlighting some of the inequities that sometimes happen around the pay structure. So thinking about how, how to adequately and appropriately compensate all, all individuals working in the field, including mentors um, and, and consumers. So I think there's um, more attention and awareness is what I'm seeing and hearing about. Um, and I think that there's some shift away from some of the more traditional models that I, for example, represent in terms of my, my training. Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree. I would say also, uh, I did a lot of work in this field. Um, most of it was volunteer, but uh, before I had my education or while I was in university and um, a lot of those roles were like peer support or peer mentorship type roles. Um, I also really enjoyed, and, and I think this is probably happening more and more as research is more funded, um, a lot of community-based research projects or um, that are, you know, kind of studying marginalized populations will look to like community advisory boards or things like that with people with lived experience uh, to kind of direct or help shape the research and program. And so I've participated on a number of those, uh, not as a therapist, but as a person with lived experience. And I find that that was always very rewarding to be able to work with those researchers who are doing that, that institutional work and be able to give your input. Um, and then volunteering with or working with like community organizations that are doing some of this work in less formal ways. Uh, I'm biased, but I got started with Netic and it's like a very lovely small team of humans just like making resources and like doing education and doing all this great stuff. And it's not, I never had this sense of it being like hierarchical or like elitist or anything that like hospitals or universities can feel like. I think those community organizations like Sheena's Place, like Netic can be such a lovely space to kind of start getting work uh, experience in the field. Thanks, Nolan. I think, Amanda, had you unmuted before? Is there anything you wanted to add? I feel like most of it has been said, and then someone in the chat put in um, an item around peer support roles, which um, have, you know, don't require any background in education and training, but really have to do with your own interpersonal skills and your own experience and positionality, too. So those are a great option. Agreed. All right, so we have two more questions. I'll, I'll try to combine them because they're both about um, the same topic. Um, so wondering for panelists, and I think this is mostly directed towards Amanda and Jennifer who spoke to, to funding and grants, um, but how, like what have you found to be the most effective way or ways for getting money and funding? Any strategies? Um, I, I guess like from a, a policy, public health standpoint, when I write about the work I'm going to do, I really try to sell it with, within certain contexts and put a spin on it that will make um, government decision makers and, and other folks reviewing grants feel like it's appealing. And that's kind of like a sad and harsh reality of trying to sell um, the issue of eating disorders. And so um, I think that the governments of, you know, provincial governments across Canada and then the, the government of Canada and funding bodies more generally have been a lot more accepting and open to accepting um, applications around eating disorders research in the past few years that we've talked about. But 
one thing that folks um, in the space will do was they'll talk about um, or they'll integrate eating disorders research into general mental health grants, for example, or they'll talk about exploring disordered eating um, in reaction to a nutrition policy and they'll apply to nutrition grants. And so I think we get pretty creative when we need to find a space for our work, even though, of course, it is getting a lot better on that front. And then I think there's also um, people, different people in the field have different beliefs uh, about the role that industry funding can play. Um, and I know that folks from different countries have collaborated with um, industry organizations that um, will provide money for research or for um, outreach and access to services. And so although different people have different uh, opinions on taking money from industry, that's always an option that people can consider as well. Thanks, Amanda. Sorry, there's no, things rolling down the hallway behind me. So apologies if you have background noise. I think it's over now. Um, I, I see on the call that there are some colleagues from the National In Initiative for Eating Disorders or NEED. And um, one thing that's coming to mind is the Canadian Eating Disorder Strategy that was put together by um, the primary Canadian eating disorders organization. So please correct me if I missed something. I think it was NEDIC plus NEED plus uh, the Eating Disorders Association of Canada and the um, Eating Disorders Foundation of Canada and bringing together stakeholders. And I think this provides some of the foundation that although we're not in a place where Australia is, we're working towards having more na national stakeholder discussions and starting to do those priority setting exercises and um, bring, bring together a, a more united voice that is, is helping move forward the, the field as well. So I think that's one of the steps that has already been made and then some of the individual groups. Uh, thank you for putting that uh, in the chat area. Um, uh, some of the in individual groups of researchers who are bringing together different stakeholders as well, rather than it just being the small group of people at any one institution that is also helping us move forward because uh, some of the challenges that have been trying to have enough participants it's hard to do at any one site. So really about bringing together multiple sites to have enough um, detail in, in the research data to be able to, to draw conclusions and then build on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer. So I see that we have, we do have someone with their hand raised and we have a couple other questions in the chat. Um, just being mindful of time, I think what we'll do is we will uh, go into our breakout rooms now, and you're welcome to ask those questions. Go into the breakout room um, that corresponds to the person uh, who you have a question for. So how it will work is Ari will open the rooms and um, all attendees can choose which room they would like to join. Um, so you'll like hover your, your cursor over one and click join. Um, the rooms will be open for about 12 minutes. Um, we will not record uh, those breakout rooms. Um, and when the 12 minutes are done, we'll close the rooms and we'll invite everyone back um, to the main room for a final wrap up and reflection with our panelists. Um, if you have questions, um, feel free to hang back in the main room. Ari or myself will be here uh, and we'll be floating between the, the rooms. So um, Ari, go ahead and you can pause the recording and open up the rooms. Awesome. Okay, so with our last five minutes together, um, I'm curious about final reflections from our panelists. What what stands out to you most about today's panel? Um, either sharing that and or any advice you have to folks who are are hoping to to get involved in the eating disorders field. Who'd like to start? Amanda. Sure. I think one thing that's been stressed by most of the responses is like the need for a community and coalition and teamwork across. And so um, maybe one final point for folks that are interested in joining the field or are just starting out is to reach out to networks and connections. I've never reached out to anyone in the eating disorders field in Canada and had them ignore me or tell me no. So I think that really is a testament to how much we all want to work together to overcome or at least uh, take on some of those challenges and barriers that we've been talking about today.
maybe I can take this opportunity to um, to thank Sheena's Place and Netic for organizing this. One of the questions is about what do we what do we need to do as a field to help encourage? And I think this type of event, um, of, of course, it's probably the people who already have an interest in the field who may be more likely to notice, but in thinking about this, this spirit and how can we um, uh, open up these discussions and talk, talk about some of those, those rewards and how to address some of the challenges that, that may come up to, to keep this, in my perception, really forward moving uh, momentum that we're seeing in the field right now. And thanks to all of the attendees for, for your questions and your uh, willingness to attend today and, and engage in the breakout rooms. Thanks, Jennifer. And John, I think I saw you in mute. Yeah, just uh, an extension of Jennifer's message, uh, a lot of gratitude to you specifically, Caitlin and, and Ari, for the work you've done. Um, a lot of appreciation for, for folks who uh, chose to, to be here. For folks in the Eastern uh, time zone, this is probably beyond your, your normal workday. Uh, so for taking the time and, and showing the interest. Uh, and, uh, and to the panelists, it's a real pleasure to meet all of you and, and hope uh, our paths cross in the future. So thanks uh, to everybody all around. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I would echo all the same sentiments. It's been such a lovely time. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks for the really enriching, beautiful questions that came up in the breakout room. And I also know I didn't get to all of them. So uh, if anybody does want to connect after, I'm happy to have like Ari and Caitlin share my contact information and you're more than welcome to reach out. Um, yeah, it's just really inspiring to see such a large turnout for this. Um, and I'm, uh, I really encourage all of you, despite your fears and your doubts to, you know, do this work if that's what you want to do and to dive in. Um, it's such a lovely, small but mighty group of folks that are doing great work. So welcome to this field and um, please join us. I echo that and and all of what you all have shared. Thank you so much for, for, for participating in this panel. Um, thank you to our attendees for coming and for asking really good questions. Um, I see in the chat, uh, as well, a couple of ideas. Thanks, Wendy. A segment on TV and reporters. Yes, media coverage is um, is is a is a great way to to spread awareness and, and understanding. Um, Ari has also put a link in the chat. Um, actually, two links in the chat. The first is an anonymous feedback form about today's panel. Um, we are obsessed with feedback. We love it. Please, please, please share. Um, what you liked about the event, what you didn't like, and that will help us um, plan future events like this one. Um, and then the second link Ari has shared in the chat um, is about facilitating webinars for us. So we are, are always looking for new ideas and, and for folks to uh, facilitate webinars. Um, Sheena's Place Netic, as you can see, we do a lot of this together. So we do have an application form, a proposal form, uh, also on SurveyMonkey, so you're welcome to check that out and to share it with whoever you would like. Um, everyone will also get an email right about now with the uh, the feedback form link as well. Um, and again, this will be posted on our YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks, um, so feel free to share it. And thank you all so much for being here and, and wishing everyone a lovely evening.